This time we do have, we do indeed have Julia Boyd live on the line from London talking about her new book, Travellers in the Third Reich, The Rise of Fascism Through the Eyes of Everyday People. Julia, good morning to you. Good morning. Good to have you with us. It seems incredible, doesn't it? We, we tend to, it's, it's a period of, it's a, it's an aspect of history that we perhaps haven't really looked at before, but Germany was, in the, between, the, the, between the wars, was an incredibly popular tourist destination. That's right. Um, and it was a great surprise to me, too, I have to say, when I started researching this book. Um, but it, it became very quickly apparent to me that soon after the First World War, um, the British wanted to go back to Germany. They felt a great connection with the country. They felt a far closer connection with the Germans, really, than they did with the French. And um, I was very surprised at uh, this devotion to Germany and how, how it had survived it, with many people, it had, it had survived the First World War. And I suppose one of the things as well, apart from the fact that obviously the British royal family is Saxe Coburg became the Windsors, um, was the, the, the fact that um, the Americans as well wanted to come over because it, it was almost as seen as, as, as Germany having suffered d- during the war and they were helping put the country back on its feet in a certain way. Well, that was certainly true financially in the mid-20s. But the other important thing to remember is that Something like 8 million Americans had German parents or grandparents um, after the First World War. And uh, so, you know, they had family. They, they felt very close to Germany. Um, so quite soon, certainly by the mid-20s, when Germany was also becoming more prosperous again, thanks to American loans, um, people started going there in great numbers. I have to say that uh, between the wars, it was mainly Americans and Brits who were travelling in, in Germany. Um, the French, uh, especially after they occupied the Ruhr in 1923, were deeply unpopular. Um, there was real hatred of the French, but the, the Brits and the Americans were in a different category. The Germans wanted to be friends with us. They wanted to win our friendship and respect. And I suppose one of the things is, it's, it's interesting because obviously you're looking at a period from, say, 1920 through to, really, 1938, Thomas Cook were advertising Germany was still... A, a, well, a, even 39. My own mother was touring around in Germany in the summer of 1939. Extraordinary. But uh, young people particularly were in Germany right up until the eve of the First World War, uh, the Second World War. And the thing is, I mean, the, 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 you chart in the book the, the, the changes in the political system because obviously 1920s, you have the Weimar and Germany comes very, you know, Berlin is the place to go and it's, it's seen as decadent and, mm, and you know, they go, they go for sun and, and, and a little bit of naughtiness. And, yeah, and, right on. <laughs> right, well, t- well, you seem to have leapt into that one, Julia, so tell us a little bit about the naughtiness then. Well, you know, Britain was a pretty stuffy place. I remember reading a, a, a one letter in a, in a correspondence column of somebody who'd just been in Germany and had seen everybody wearing open neck shirts and they stripped off. I mean, there were topless women playing badminton in the forest um, in in the 1920s, whereas he'd come back to England and seen a gardener mowing the lawn in 90 degrees with a a three-piece suit on and a bowler hat. (laughs) So, I mean, there was a sort of, there was a kind of breaking out, an unstuffiness about, um, well, certainly in Berlin, although one has to be careful here because if you went into uh, rural Germany or to the villages and towns, it was it was a very different matter. And, of course, people had hardly seen any foreigners at all, so they were creatures of great fascination and interest. And, of course, uh, it also uh, Germany, with its history and its culture, and, and Berlin, and we'll talk about Berlin in particular, uh, attra- attracted artists uh, such as, it, for example, Isherwood uh, went there. Yeah, of course. I think... One can't um, overestimate the the grip that German culture had on our our own sense of education and civilization. Goethe and Kant and, of course, all the great musicians, Beethoven and Wagner and so on. So um, there was a strong feeling that you weren't really an educated, civilized person if you weren't familiar with, with German culture and language. Um, how much, though, did, did you find in your research that 
how aware were tourists? Again, I can you can you can kind of say, well, during the twenties, it's the Weimar, but after nineteen thirty three, with the rise of national socialism, um, how aware were tourists of of what was going on in Germany? I Meaning, the book opens with uh, a, a tale of, of of a holiday and couple in Germany in the late thirties, and and they are approached by uh, you know a, a Jewish woman with her child, saying, you know, please take my child out of this country. Yes. Well, I think it's a very good question, and I think it very much depended on the individual who was there. I mean, some people were looking for it um, and interested and wanted to know what was going on. Uh, But my own feeling was, having spent about three or four years doing the research for this book, was that many people went to Germany having made up their minds before they even got there. So if you came from uh, the political right you saw a country that was being put back on its feet by an inspirational leader. And it was exciting. Infrastructure was being built. Um, the young, particularly the young, were very idealistic, wanting to serve their country and their community. There was a sense of vibrancy and energy about the country that many Brits felt was lacking here because there was a depression and the democracy seemed to be weak and Uh, Whereas in Germany, there was this sense of rejuvenation. Now, if you came from the left, of course, you saw a very, very different picture. You saw brutality, you saw suppression, you saw absolute clamping down on all free thinking and uh, individuality. So it really depended where you came from. But then in the middle, of course, you had tourists many of whom people like um, Philip Larkin's father, the, the, the poet's father, uh, used to take his family there, I think something like seven years in a row, um, on holiday. And if you went there on holiday, you, well, you were charmed by the people who were so friendly and kind and the nice, clean hotels that were cheap and the women in their dandles and the flower boxes and the beer and the happy school children singing in unison as they marched up a mountain. So, you know, it very much depended on you as an individual. There were, of course, the horrible signs outside every village saying Jews not wanted. But then there was a lot of anti-Semitism in this country. And people felt that, well, it may not be very nice what the Germans, uh, the way the Germans were treating the Jews, but, well, it wasn't really their business. Um, mm. So you get a huge variety of reactions. And is this, but this... I think, sorry, I was just going to say, I think in my own case, I feel that people should, after 1935, have been much more aware. 1935 was the year of the the Nuremberg Laws, when Jews were stripped of their, their, um, their nationality. And there had been, Dachau had opened only a few weeks after Hitler came to power in 1933. There was the book burning, there was the, um, the boycotts of Jewish shops and so on. There was plenty of evidence but not everybody chose to see it. Mm, we've all been, already been through Crystal Nacht and all the, 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 that entailed as well. There's, a, there's some wonderful pictures in here, if you have a, you know, a slightly whatever sense of humour. But there's, a, there's a, one of the pictures, that I, the, the two pictures that I really made me certain take notice. One of them is, is, a, is, a, is a British gentleman, you know, in his tweeds and his plus fours, outside his, and you, you're laughing because you know the picture. And he's got his caravan, he's sometime in, somewhere in Germany, possibly Bavaria in the mid-30s, and now he's got all the flags of the places that he's maybe going. And he's got, you know, I can see what looks like a, there's definitely a union flag there, and there's definitely what looks like maybe an Australian flag, or a royal standard. And then there's, there's, a, there's a swastika proudly flying as well. Yes, I know. Um, I think of course, uh, those on the, the right end of the political spectrum in this country, there were two things. They were terrified. Uh, you know, they, A lot of aristocrats and upper class people supported Hitler because they believed that German, um, the, the Nazis were always uh, pressing this threat of communism and um, so there was a general fear of, of, of communism and, and the sort of upper classes the upper echelons of society in this country but also a lot of uh, soldiers who had fought in the First World War were um, very pro-Hitler because above all they wanted to prevent another war I mean they didn't want their sons to have to go through the horror that they'd been through so you find quite a, a surprisingly large swathe of people who um, supported Hitler, including, I have to say, the number of people in the church. 
was one sort of horrific character who came back from, in 1939, saying how wonderful Hitler was. Um, there was no excuse for any traveller to Germany in 1939, I think, not to be horrified by what was going on. Although, even though I say that, you, you know, you could have a perfectly nice holiday in Germany and not see anything nasty, but you had to be pretty blinkered especially after Kristallnacht in 1938. And the, one, the other um, thing, the thing is, though, when they talk about, you know, pictures, you have to be pretty blinkered to have a nice holiday. But one pic, one, I almost, because I have a copy of the book sitting before me right now, and one of the pictures that when I first opened up the book, which is marvellous, was, was the Matthews family. And, and then... Uh, yes, that was an unbelievable bit of luck. I mean, how about this for luck? A lot of research ends up being luck. And I happened... To have a, a, a friend of mine was at a dinner party. They started talking about Germany. She, she'd never met this guy before. And she said, oh, my friend's doing a, a book. And he said, oh, I've got this wonderful picture of Hitler. Um, and he let me use it in the book. I mean, you know, how lucky was that? It's, it's, it's a picture of, of, of basically a, a, a group of English schoolgirls, and they're sta- and they're laughing, and they're joking, and they're standing. And, and one of the schoolgirls is, is wearing, you know, a pretty floral top, and a gentleman ha- in a hat has his hand on her shoulder, and it's the Führer, it's Hitler. I know. I mean, the chances of finding an unpublished photograph of Hitler with a group of British tourists. Well, you know, you can imagine the odds are not exactly favourable. And, and, um, and it's a wonderful picture. And I don't know uh, whether your list would be interested, but it, the, 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 the guy who took the photograph was a Dr. Matthews, who was a GP in Bournemouth. And he was very proud of this photograph, which he displayed in his, um, in his surgery. And um, after the war began, um, patients began to rather wonder about this. So a policeman came round and said... Uh, well, Dr. Matthews, I think it might be a good idea if you put that particular photograph away until after the war. <laughs> yes, it probably would have been a good idea. Uh, probably a good idea not to have the picture of Adolf Hitler on your mantelpiece whilst you're fighting for the war, wars going on. Tell me a little bit about, we're talking about, because there's a World Cup on at the moment, in case you hadn't noticed, and, mm-hmm. and these big sporting events uh, tend to, draw, to bring tourists flocking to wherever they come. Of course, 1936, perhaps with the most famous or infamous yeah. Olympics of them all, was uh, 36 in Berlin. What did that have? What I asked did that have in terms of, of A, tourism, and B, there's some fascinating sales that, that some of the athletes themselves, uh, some of the athletes from the American, especially the African-American athletes, yeah. found Germany not to be as bad as you might have thought. No, I think this is, this is, this is one of the more sort of fascinating things that I, I thought came out of, of my research. Um, um, of course, uh, the, the, the black athletes, the African-American athletes, were hugely successful at that Olympic. It wasn't just Jesse Owen, there were, there were others. And what, what to me was so interesting is when they went back to America, they were interviewed, and um, the, the journalists were all longing for them to say how horrible and hideous the Nazis were. And I remember particularly one black athlete who won a gold medal said, well, I didn't see any uh, nasty Nazis. I saw only nice people. And, and this is a really telling thing that he said, I didn't have to ride in the back of the bus. And, uh, I mean, when you think about it, it, it is perhaps one of the reasons why many Americans were reticent about criticizing the Nazis because, um, you know, their own record, the way they were treating their own population, their African-American um, population, was, uh, was in many ways, one would have to say, comparable to what was happening in Nazi Germany. How, how closely did German propaganda or Nazi propaganda then uh, work with the, Ger- the German tourism industry and indeed companies, uh, British companies and American companies, uh, to promote this, this vision of Germany as an Aryan utopia? Well, the extraordinary thing is that um, I've, I think I quote it in the book. There was a Thomas Cook brochure um, published in July 1939, something like a month before a couple of months before the war broke out, saying, don't believe what you read in the newspapers. Germany is a lovely country, full of lovely people, doing lovely things, and, or words to that effect. And so the uh, travel companies tended to just turn a blind eye to what was going on and go on pushing holidays in Germany because um, they were so popular and it was a very good, uh, it was a very good product, if you like. Um, and it, it is extraordinary, um, but I think by 1938-39, the volume of tourists to Germany had really been reduced to a trickle. 
Um, but certainly the travel companies were, were pushing it. Um, and one of the great um, draws was the Oberammergau um, passion play, which uh, Cooks in particular made a great thing of. And in, I think the first tours they took from this country to Oberammergau was in 19... I think it was about 1925. Um, and um, that was one of the first moments when British tourists started going back in considerable numbers to Germany. Well, how did you go about then, beginning the research for this book and finding out these materials with these fascinating stories? <laughs> well, that's a very good question. I'd have to say a lot of it, as I've just said now, is, is luck. You, you know, you have a sort of random conversation with somebody on the bus um, who says, oh, I know this or I know that or I've got a diary or my Uncle Joe drove around Germany in 1936 and I think I've still got his journal. Um, so a lot of that. Um, there's a lot to be found in archives or all over the place. Um, it's the sort of research you can't actually do without modern technology because I can find that there's a set of letters I'm interested in in, in a University of South Dakota, but there's no way I can hop on a plane and go off to South Dakota every five minutes. But you, you then email the archivist, um, and they send you. They can scan the letters you're interested. So you know it's 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 made an enormous difference to doing this kind of research, which is real grassroots stuff, and you spend a huge amount of time trying to track down rather obscure references. Um, Ninety percent of the time, you probably are going to find a dead end. But that ten percent, it's really exciting because you feel you're you're uncovering what I sort of think of as raw, unfiltered history. This is this is what people were thinking and seeing at the time, without the benefit of uh, hindsight. And particularly with this period, because I was born in 1948, so I grew up with the war as a very powerful back to my childhood and we knew the outcome we knew the evil of the nazis and the holocaust but the point of this book was to try and recreate a sense of what it was like to travel in germany before any of that was known or foreseen and of course you were you spent some time in germany as well in the 70s didn't you in the 80s so you it's a it's a, it's a yes. an area that you are or a country that you're very familiar with yes it was um, a very interesting time to be there because i think there was some survey done and um, it, it was discovered that most 10 year old German children thought that Hitler was the name of a pop group or something and this of course threw the Germans into a great panic um, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying it but suddenly when we were there in the late 70s and early 80s was a time when Germany suddenly began to really look hard at its Nazi past and so the, every day in the Frankfurt Allgemeine, there was a leader about the Third Reich. Or, um, schools were doing more programs. There was the Fest film. There were more and more books. And one has to absolutely hand it to the Germans. They have been quite extraordinary in their diligence and absolute uh, rigor in looking at their past. And one of the things that, that, that struck me, just flicking through the book, I haven't given a full authority, it was, it's the the way that people are saying in these in these brochures and these things, come and discover the gel delights of uh, of Germany, the untouched town. Because you tend to forget that in the First World War it had been fought away from from the from the exactly. fatherland, and yet after the Second World War, places like Dresden, uh, you know, all these beautiful cities were absolutely devastated. Uh, devastated. I know it's true, and I suppose that's part of the reason why. Um, I think until this day, I mean, um, my husband and I were, had a wonderful driving holiday in Germany last October, but we didn't see, I mean, I think tourists go to Munich and they go to Berlin, but you don't meet any foreigners just driving around in the middle of Germany, and it is such a, a beautiful country. But of course, you're absolutely right. After the First World War, the country was totally intact. <laughs> my goodness, I mean, cities like Frankfurt, which was an absolute sort of medieval gem were of course totally obliterated and Darmstadt so there is sadness when you go through go to those cities today to think what was lost on the other hand the Germans have done an extraordinarily good job in in rebuilding for instance Dresden um, and uh, it is still a stunning country it's physically so beautiful and there are so many wonderful things to see um, that I, you know, I, I, I recommend it for anybody who's wondering they want to go and spend a week driving around in Europe, um, not to forget Germany. 
I recommend this book as well. The book is called Travels in the Third Reich, The Rise of Fascism Through the Eyes of Everyday People. It's by Julia Boyd. Julia, if people want to find out more about you or about the book, um, is there a website, is there social media? Well, um, the Amazon, um, the Amazon um, uh, site has got quite a lot of information. And um, my publishers, who uh, are, are wonderful, Elliot and Thompson, have a website um, and um, they've got a lot of blogs and things. And it's been Waterston's um, pick of the month, a non, uh, paperback non-fiction pick of the month this month. So there are displays of it everywhere in Waterston's bookshops. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I reckon I'm the, the hobby, the hobby writer who got lucky. I certainly uh, didn't expect it to to have. Um, stirred so much interest. And got such, such great reviews as well. Compelling, the Daily Telegraph said. Fascinating, the best spectator called it. Only ask, once you've done something like this, and what have you got your sights on next? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something really interesting. I'm in collaboration with a German friend who I met when I was researching Travellers in Third Reich. She comes from a village right down in the south of Germany um, in the Bavarian Alps. And she uh, was asked by her village to write a history of the village during the Nazi times. And we both think that it's a book that should be written in English. So we're now writing this together, a completely different book. Um, but having looked at this period through the eyes of many different people, we're now looking, I'm now looking at it through the lens of one particular village. Uh, and there's an enormous amount of material, all the archives, uh, the, all the minutes of the local council meetings and the newspapers it, it, are all there. So it's a fascinating look in microcosm of what happened in Germany, but seen through this one particular village. And I think that's going to be, um, I hope, it will be of, of equal interest as, as Travellers. I'm sure it will be. The book is called Travellers in the Third Reich. It's by Julia Boyd. Uh, Julia, thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed talking to you.